on National Affairs. My name is Jill Myman, and I'm a senior in early childhood education from Nevada, Iowa. And this is our final week and the speakers on strengthening families. I would like to thank the College of Family and Consumer Sciences, the Institute for Social and Behavioral Research Psychology, and the Institute on National Affairs. It is a special pleasure for me to be able to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. David Elkind. Dr. David Elkind is, is a professor of child study at Tufts University in Massachusetts. He is also a former professor of education, psychology, and psychiatry at the University of Rochester. He obtained his doctorate at UCLA and then spent a year as David Rappaport's research assistant at the Austin Riggs Center in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. In 1965, he was a National Science Foundation senior postdoctoral fellow at Piaget's Institute in Geneva. His research has been in the areas of perceptual, cognitive, and social development, wherein he has attempted to build upon the research and theory of Jean Piaget. Dr. Elkind's bibliography now numbers well over 400 items and includes research, theoretical articles, book chapters, and 14 books. In addition, he has published more popular pieces, such as children's stories in Jack and Jill, biographies of famous psychologists in the New York Times Magazine, as well as presentations of his work in Good Housekeeping and Psychology Today. Some of his recent articles include Computers and Young Children, Character Education Programs, The Transformation of Play, and The Authority of the Brain. He is probably best known for his books The Hurried Child, Growing Up Too Fast Too Soon, All Grown Up and No Place to Go, Teenagers in Crisis, and Miseducation, Preschoolers at Risk. The Ties That Stress, The New Family Imbalance, was published in 1994 and picks up where the hurried child leaves off. Dr. Elkind believes three changes have had a particularly stressful effect on contemporary youth. Increased freedom, including the freedom to engage in sex and drug use. Greater losses, the loss of a parent due to divorce and the notion we are losing the battle to make the world a better place to live. And a greater fear of academic failure. Dr. Elkind believes we must abandon the convenient fiction that contemporary youth are so sophisticated that they have no need of adult guidance and supervision. In his newest book, Reinventing Children, Raising Educating Children in a Changing World, Dr. Elkind um, offers detailed suggestions for, de for dealing with the complex issues children, parents, and teachers now face. Dr. Elkind is a member of some 10 professional organizations and is a consultant to state education departments, clinics and mental health centers, government agencies, and private foundations. He lectures extensively in the U.S., Canada, and abroad, and has appeared on The Today Show, Nightline, Donahue, 2020, and The Oprah Winfrey Show. He has been profiled in People and Boston Magazine as an, and is a contributing member of Parents Magazine. He is past president of the National Association for the Education of Young Children. Dr. Elkind is most interested in cognitive and social development in children and adolescents, as well as the causes and effects of stress on children, youth, and families. Some of his professional activities have included being a consultant to schools, mental health associations, and private foundations, as well as being a board member and editorial board member of, for a variety of organizations. He is also a co co-host on Kids These Days, a television program on Lifetime. Without further ado, may I introduce to you Dr. David Elkind. And there's there's also going to be a book signing and reception after he speaks. Well, thank you very much, Jill. I, I didn't fully give the short version. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here, and uh, I'd like to begin, if I may, with a uh, story which will have to uh, illustrate the, uh, uh, some of the themes I'd like to elaborate this evening. And it's a story that a first grade teacher told me recently about a young man who was coming into her first grade class from half-day kindergarten. And this young man had been in a lot of uh, programs. He'd been in traveling t-ball, he'd taken karate lessons, he'd been to computer camp, uh, he was into Suzuki violin, and his mother was gonna try him out in ballet because she thought that would round it out a little bit. <clears throat> so it was the first day of full day, first grade, and uh, the noon bell rang, and he was used to going home. So he put his backpack on, walked to the door, and was waiting to go out. And the teacher looked at him and she said, oh, no, Tim, you're a big boy. You know, you're in first grade. You get to stay the whole day. And he looked up at her and said, who the hell signed me up for this? 
<laughs> One of our were programmed uh, children. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, when I first began writing about these things more than 20 years ago, I was concerned with children and adolescents. Unfortunately, it's gone earlier than that. There's now a prenatal university, PNU, <laughs> California, of course. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> the curriculum involves reading Shakespeare to the fetus in utero, playing Mozart, and in case you have a low voice, they've invented what is called the pregophone. I don't know if you've seen this device, but it looks to me like a small plastic plunger attached by a plastic hose to a larger plastic plunger. The mother puts the plastic plunger in the stomach and talks through the smaller plastic plunger. 1595 Santa Barbara, California, comes in a, comes in a variety of colors. Uh, <laughs> and it would be amusing, again, if it, it weren't uh, sad. The, the, the <coughs> investigator who, uh, upon whom this uh, prenatal university was founded, uh, had uh, discovered that uh, indeed the fetus can respond selectively to the mother's voice. And on that fact, they built a university. Um, but in any case, uh, he, uh, when he read about his prenatal university, he, uh, he wrote an article and then sent me to reprint it, and he entitled it The Hurried Fetus. <laughs> so unfortunately, we're. we're uh, and it, it, you know, it continues with uh, lapware, so-called lapware for six-month to two-year-old infants. Uh, certainly, uh, computers are part of our world, but there's very little reason to have infants uh, dealing with, the, you know, they barely move and uh, and handle those kind of things. It's far too. Uh, I mean, computers are complex instruments, but certainly, uh, and, and many times the programs and the the, the hype is such that. Uh, parents buy them because they're being anxious. You know, if your child doesn't have a computer today, he's never going to do well. You know, I mean, Bill Gates didn't have a computer as an infant, and he seems to be okay. <laughs> so it's Stephen Jobs. I mean, all these people, uh, you know, are dealing with computers today didn't have them as infants, and they seem to have done all right. So the idea that somehow you have to start in infancy, otherwise you're never going to be. Uh, but th these programs are, are, you know, they, they build on parents' anxieties. So it's uh, seven hundred thousand units of these things were sold just last year alone. So, you know, and some of these programs, uh, you know, one is called Colors. It, it, it says it's going to teach the infant how to discriminate colors. Well, infants can discriminate colors already at four months. Already they have preferences for red. So you're not teaching them anything they don't know. And then the other thing is going to teach them how to relate colors to words. Well, kids don't have even language at that age, so how are they going to color to words? And then, so again, uh, many of the people writing some of these programs for the show no infants, uh, and uh, so we, we have to be thoughtful about these things. And so I want to talk this evening about some of the changes that uh, have happened in our society and, uh, and to parents and children. I can't talk about all these things we don't. And then some, I want to, the second half, I want to talk a little bit about some of the strategies that have emerged that we've tried to deal with some of the pressures on our children and parents today, and I think that sometimes misfire and then we have to reconsider, and, and I'll suggest some alternatives. But first, I want to talk a little bit about changes in, in the family, and we you don't have, you know, the, um, and just to contrast the sort of modern uh, versus the postmodern, or whatever, I don't want to get fancy about the language, it's just simply whatever happened to our society before and after mid century is a convenient road park. And I want to talk a little bit about families. And, uh, parents in the modern world, uh, up until about mid century, and, uh, there was sort of a nuclear family, and, and parents were seen as uh, intuitively knowledgeable about child growth and development. There was a lot of support for parents. Parents were respected, and their role was important. And uh, it was re it reflected in the media, where parents like, you know, Ozzie and Harriet, and uh, father knows best. You may not have liked it, but they were parents who, you know, played parental roles. Uh, the kids obeyed them, and so on. And the parents were seen as intuitively knowledgeable about child growth and development. Most parents have grown up in large families or even extended families. Um, and so they, there have been a lot of kids around at different age levels, cousins and brothers and uncles and aunts and so on. And so they had a little sort of intuitive knowledge about children at different age levels. And so those who wrote for parents at that time uh, just assumed that parents needed a little more information about child growth and development and they could put that together with their own experience and, and really do some, you know, 
very good child rearing. And uh, so we had Arnold Gazelle writing and, uh, about the, and he talked about children at each level, age level. He talked about the one-year-old and the two-year-old. He gave descriptions about their language and their social development, their emotional development. He talked about the six-year-old who was constantly eating and constantly talking and constantly running around and very, very self-centered and, uh, you know, very, very busy. Gun. And um, then the, the quiets down by eight and then almost a quiet, very inward turning nine and then ten. He said, this wonderful age of ten. A wonderful age of ten. Children have it all together. There used to be children. Growth has slowed down. They're used to being in school. They like their teachers. They have a lot of friends now. They like their friends. They even have a little liking for their brothers and their sisters. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful age. It's, it's really a halcyon period of childhood. These wonderful ten-year-olds have it all together. But then he said, don't get complacent. He said, because this wonderful ten-year-old turns 11, and then he or she turns 12, and where before you was a ferret could do no wrong, now you can do no right. You don't know how to talk, you don't know how to walk, and I don't want to be seen with you, particularly at Kmart. <laughs> so, uh, and, but, but he was saying, here are what happens normally, and, and, and then at 16 you get again this new, uh, again, new stage of equilibrium and so on. And what he was trying to say was that the, 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 the stage of development, these are very normal for, and parents could have a sense of what kids were all about, and from that they could then make some judgments and, and uh, develop their sort of tailor-made uh, child-rearing techniques. And uh, Freud and Piaget and Erickson all talked about the stages of development and so on. And, uh, and uh, some of Freiburg in the Magic Years, that wonderful book she talked about that, you know, the two-year-old and the five-year-old and the dinosaur for the two-year-old is a very different dinosaur than the dinosaur for the five-year-old because the two-year-old is a big scary thing and so on and deals, but they have it small and they can deal with some of their anxieties. But by five, they want to know the which different dinosaurs and when they grew and what period they were from and so on. Very different dinosaur. And that, so that uh, children are different at different age levels and it's important to know those differences. But they didn't, uh, they just talked about how children were, were different. Um, and then uh, children were seen, uh, well, let's talk about what happened to parents in, in, the, in the, uh, the modern era, well, the postmodern era, with the, all the changes that came about in the 50s and the, the 60s, the, the civil rights movement, Vietnam War, Watergate, uh, uh, women's movement, really dramatic changes in our society. Um, the, the second sector revolution with the fact that, that uh, premarital sex for the first time became socially acceptable in our society. Dramatic change in, in, uh, in our society uh, moving towards uh, uh, making divorce more easy, uh, no fault divorce and so on. All these kinds of changes made dramatic changes in the family and uh, certainly changes in our perception of parents. Uh, for the first time now, parents began to be seen no longer as intuitively knowledgeable about child growth and development, but now as in need of technique. Parents are no longer able, they, you, know, you know, so many of the writers of the modern era said, you're a good enough parent, you know, you don't have to go to college, you don't have to take course, you, you're common sense, you're a good enough parent. And, and you know, and Donald Winnicott in England and, and uh, even <coughs> Benjamin Spock here, Use your common sense, you know. We, I'll give you some information about child growth and development, but you know, it's okay. You don't have to, you know, uh, it isn't rocket science kind of things we'd say today. Uh, but then, just you need to know a, a little bit about it. And so, um, there was that kind of reassurance to parents. But and after the after the '60s, suddenly we, we began to see parents as is not very knowledgeable about child development and in need of a lot of training and techniques. And there's a whole new perception of parents as in need of technique. And, and the books now about are how to, how to parent, how to talk to your children so your children will listen, listen to your children will talk, how to teach character, how to raise a moral child, and so on. Uh, all these how-to books, and many of them suggest that if you don't do what they say you're supposed to do, you're going to create a monster or you're going to lose your self-esteem or something like that. And so we have to be, there's always kind of, uh, and uh, Unfortunately, a lot of these books undermine parental kind of good sense uh, by often, uh, and uh, many of them are well-intentioned. Uh, I am not uh, 
between parent and child started a lot of this, and, and he made a very important point that that we talk to children, the language we use with children is important. It's important what we say to kids and how we say it, uh, because uh, you know words are powerful. And words have a lot of meaning, and so you really have to be thoughtful about that. I remember in kindergarten, I still remember. I I, I love to sing, but I I can't carry a tune. And the teacher that we had was a very, she ran the chorus and so on, and we had a very gifted group of kindergarten children who sang very well. And uh, I chimed in, of course, but uh, then we had a visitor coming in, and the children were going to sing for this visitor. And uh, just before he came in, uh, she looked at me and said, Elkind, you're a listener. <laughs> so that ruined my whole singing career. Anyway, but I, I, that still stayed with me. I think mean, what, what words words do are powerful, and, and they do have, a, and we have to be thoughtful about the words we use with children. And, and I think he made a very important point with that. Um, but uh, then, uh, and he talked about um, you messages and I messages. It's important when we talk to children to use I messages rather than you messages, because you messages are evaluative and I messages are not. So instead of saying, you know, you, the, you did this or you did that, you say, it makes me feel good when, or it makes me feel bad when, or something like that. Um, the problem with a lot of those things is that, that they aren't based on child development. They're sort of techniques that one size fits all. For example, if you say to a four-year-old, it makes me feel good when you do that. Uh, that's well and good, but children, the four-year-olds and five-year-olds have magical thinking. They believe their thoughts have power. So if you tell a child, you made me feel good, then the child feels when you're feeling bad or have a headache or you're sick or so on, I made you feel bad. So again, we have to be thoughtful. It, uh, you can't just use techniques without knowing something about child development, and I think that's one of the problems with some of these technique things. Another is that I think it undermines uh, parenting. Too often, I think we have changed our perception of parents. We don't honor parenting and the role parents play anymore. We look at TV, uh, The Simpsons, for example, uh, that's not a very good model of a parent. Or if you look at some of the TV shows like Dawson's Creek, there are very few parents there at all. And the ones that you have in Seventh Heaven is on a, they're almost, you know, sort of, uh, they use very strange parenting techniques, uh, almost dysfunctional. And so uh, the model is that you have home alone where the parents leave the kid alone and he handles the situation. So uh, the way the depiction of parents today's world are, are uh, not uh, very good. And then parents are constantly undermined. Uh, we have parents today have to fight the system. They have to fight the media because all kinds of stuff are coming down that we can't control. Uh, things, uh, you know, um, a couple of years ago when this mother drowned her two uh, children, I had calls from mothers all over the country saying, what do I say to my daughter? She saw that on television, she's asking, mommy, are you going to drown me? You know, this kind of stuff that kids see. And so we, uh, we don't have control over the information flow to our children anymore. And uh, increasingly, um, they're selling children all sorts of, of uh, um, clothing. Uh, they understand now that you, you want to get a brand recognition. So you want to get children brand recognition early. And they're all, they have focus groups with 10 and 6 and 8 year olds to kind of, so they get brand recognition because you can brand that brand into their brain and they always buy that. And so there's tremendous effort to sell to children. And a lot of the things being sold to children are not very healthy. A lot of foods that have, uh, you know, the, they win awards for selling, you know, the advertising for um, McDonald's and other things which are high fat, high salt foods which are not good for kids. Uh, we have had a 100% increase in obesity in children in the last uh, 10 years. Too many children sitting in front of television eating junk food. And so it's hard of a parent to, to you know, you've got all this stuff coming at you, selling and kids, telling parents this is what you should be buying. So it's, and, and, you know, and the schools are not helping either, being over-pressuring children and over-testing kids. So it's much harder to be a parent at a time that when parents are being put down by the larger society and parent isn't welcome, isn't really recognized, uh, the, uh, the other social institutions are not helping. So uh, we really have to, I mean, I, you know, a lot of organizations I would really try to help to upgrade uh, parenting and, and provide value, value the role that parents play. Uh, but anyway, this idea that parents uh, that parenting is just a matter of learning techniques, that you can learn these techniques, and you don't have to use your good judgment or know something about child development, I think is a mistake. In any case, the children, our perception of children changed as well. 
Uh, we used to see children as innocent. There was a golden hero of childhood for the last 60 years, the end of the 19th century, to the middle of this, where we saw children as innocent. You know, as in, as, as really childhood, for a long time, um, childhood was seen as a, as a time of when, um, stating from the sort of the Catholic background, that the children were born with original sin, and that they had to get it out of them, and they were willful, and so on. You know, and you know, and there were some really straight and, and awful kinds of things said and done to children to sort of break their will and get this stone out of them. But um, around the end of the 19th century, a new attitude developed uh, for a lot of different reasons, a, a new humanitarian attitude in society generally and so on. And we had a new recognition of children as a, suddenly as a children as innocent, as, as in childhood is a very special time. And it's very, we had the beginning of child development and the beginning of, of the science and study and began to study children. And the child labor laws were passed and compulsory education laws were passed. We began to see children and childhood as a special time that needed to be protected. The children were, were young and they were innocent. And uh, we, the schools tried to protect children. We had the John Dewey program of education and trying to gear children to educational system to where children were um, and there was a lot of, of there were programs for children um, there was, and, and television was you know at first when children television first began 50 percent of programming was for kids and it was good program um, and there was also the Hayes office which was a, a really it was really a, a censorship. I mean, you couldn't have a movie, you couldn't have a, you know, that had any, any kind of, you know, sex in it or uh, obscenities or so on. There was a movie, a classic movie with Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert, it happened one night, and they were driving along in their car, the car breaks down, they have to stay at the inn, and there's only one room at the inn, so they have to share the room, but they're not married, so they have to hang a sheet between the two beds, and of course you don't see them unclothed, you know. So there was just, you know, and, and I remember as a kid hearing Bob Hope on the radio, and he was blipped off because he had used a word that now you hear every day on television. So there was a sense that children need to be protected, and, and that you, uh, um, and society as a whole tried to do that. Uh, we didn't really saw the posity, you know, as, as something bad. But early ripe, early rot, you know. We talked about these little geniuses who were, you know, graduated Harvard at 12 and got their PhDs at MIT at 15 or back at teaching mathematics at Harvard at 18, and then ended up collecting streetcar tra transfers in Brookline at 21. And so these were all these horror stories of all these kids who grew up fancy geniuses, and then look what happens to them. So you don't want your kid to be a genius. Um, so there was no, I mean, there wasn't anything about gifted classes, and parents didn't worry about getting their kids into gifted classes. Uh, so uh, there was a, a whole sense of society that the children were innocent in need of protection. Um, that all changed again uh, as we moved into the 50s and 60s, and we moved from a perception of children as innocent to a perception of children as competent. Uh, today, children are ready and able to deal with all life's vicissitudes. And certainly children are much more competent than we may have given them credit for being in the past, but they're certainly much less competent than we would like them to be. And the reason that we would move from this new, this new perception of children didn't have anything to do with new findings or new data or research or theories. It wasn't that there was a new Piaget appeared on the scene and said, aha, today children are competent, you know, uh, and I can show you all this. We don't have any evidence like that. And unfortunately, many, many developmentalists trying to, now trying to research and prove that, that children are more competent and talk about theories of mind and children which doesn't make any sense. But anyway, um, there is this kind of new sense of competence, but it came not, and it has to be remembered, it didn't come from any new research, any new findings. It really came from our need as an adult society to have competent children. Now that we have, you know, two parents working, now that we have all of this stuff coming out of television, now we have uh, advertising and so on. If we didn't believe that children were competent to deal with all this stuff, we'd go crazy as parents, so we have to see children as competent. And certainly children are more competent than we, you know, we gave them credit for being in the past, but they aren't as competent as we like them to be, and that's why we have so many stress problems, because we're over-programming children, we're exposing a lot of stuff, and kids can take it, but um, there, are, uh, you know, there are consequences and prices to be paid, and, and uh, one of the things we see with college students now is when you take a year off, and just to 
I'm around because I haven't had a chance to be a child and fool around for a while. Uh, and all these kids have been so pressured. And, uh, so um, certainly uh, we want to give children credit for the abilities. Uh, Montessori recognized that children, if you, gave, if you created a child-sized <coughs> environment with child-sized chairs and child-sized tissues and child-sized cups and spoons and things, children could do many things that they couldn't do before. But that was because they were living in an adult-sized environment. If you downsized it, you simply really gave them capacities that they already had, but they were prevented from having. But the competencies that I see people expecting children to have now, they want to push the curriculum further to further down. Uh, it was here people want to push down algebra and the elementary. Uh, crazy. If you don't know anything about child development, you know, it, it takes a whole new level of ability. And so uh, all of these things are simply based upon this notion of, of competence. And kids, uh, I, I find magazines saying that, uh, you know, uh, latchkey experience is good for children. It teaches them independence and taking care of themselves and so on. It's nonsense. And it's a frightening experience for children to be left home alone. And uh, certainly some parents may need to leave children home alone. But if you have to, then it's important to teach them the skills of what people to phone, how to do, what happened in an emergency, and so on. It's a stressful situation. Deal with it as stressful. Don't sort of rationalize it and make it as good for kids. And that's what I see too much of. So this notion of competence, I think, is one of the reasons that we're hurrying children so much today. Because we see, we feel we can, you know, they can deal with all this stuff. And it takes some of the pressure off us as parents and teachers and so if kids are competent, I can handle it. I don't have to worry about it so much. I can do my thing. Uh, but I think we have to re rethink that whole competence idea. Finally, uh, adolescence uh, in the modern era was seen as immature and need of adult guidance and direction. Um, and there were many clubs for young people, clubs within the community. Uh, high school teachers had after school clubs, debating clubs, and chess clubs, and so on. There was a lot of sense that adult, that the kids are half grown, they still need adult guidance and direction. And that, uh, that was very important for them to have that. And there were a lot of facilities. Fraternal orators like the Masons, and, you know, had De Molay. There was a lot of sense, and there were the Boy Scouts. They had the Explorer Scouts and the Sea Scouts and, and the <coughs> Scouts for Adolescents. So there was a sense that adults really needed uh, children, really, and adolescents really needed adults' uh, guidance and direction. That changed, and again, it was reflected in our media, reflected in our stores, reflected in the jobs that kids had. Even when kids did have jobs, there was a kind of uh, a sense of mentoring of them and training of them so the jobs were meaningful. Um, all of that changed again with the 15th, 16th, and, and kids became, you know, no longer children, no longer seen as immature, but now are regarded as sophisticated, ready and able to deal with all of life's vicissitudes. They know sex, they know drugs, they're able to deal with all these things. So we don't have to, as adults, take care of these more, and we don't have to <coughs> monitor them, we don't have to deal with them. Uh, they're, they're adults and they're grown up and I think all, more and more we sort of abrogated our responsibilities to young people uh, because we believe that they're sophisticated now so they know drugs, they know sex and so on, uh, they, they know computers better than we do so they can do it on their own and no longer, and so the clubs have disappeared, uh, there are many fewer organiza organized activities run by the high schools. Uh, it's a very different kind of world, uh, and again, certainly young people are much more sophisticated uh, than they used to be, but less than we like. And if you look at the girls, the teenage teenage girls seem to be a particular target for everybody today. And, and if you look at the teenage magazines, the girls are all, you know, uh, all kind of more coming out every day, and some of the stuff is quite quite gross in terms of the kinds of things they're trying to concern. Some is, is you know, some of the necessary information, but a lot of it is just uh, kind of get, how to get your guy, how to do all this kind of stuff, and away from many of the kind of themes that used to be in some of these magazines, which had to do with career, had to do with political and social issues, and now it's much more about diet and body and all these kinds of things that are... Anyway, so uh, and, uh, I think we, we moved away now uh, from recognizing that these people are, uh, young people are mature and treating them more and more as, as young adults. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, one consequence of all of this is that you know, we see all of the kinds of problems that we're having today in many, many different ways. Uh, one of the things we're seeing in our schools, and it's, I, I talked a lot about stress and, and stress, uh, you know, leading to all kinds of symptoms. Hurrying leads to, to stress and stress symptoms. 
But what I sense increasingly in our society and young people is, in addition to being hurried, children are angry and teenagers are angry. And anger leads to incivility. And what we're seeing increasingly in our schools, uh, which is a venue for anger for young people, is increasing incivility. I think we see much less respect for teachers, uh, much more sashing and talking back to teachers. Um, and uh, that reflects a lot of the attitude in the larger society. We see much more stealing and much more cheating in schools, um, which is incident. And we see much more cruelty, cruelty which the kids have always been cruel to one another, but it's a new kind of cruelty, a more serious kind of cruelty. And I think it reflects the fact that, that we're, as a society, not looking after children and adolescents the way we once did. We're looking after ourselves, and as a result, I think young people are angry angry at the fact that they are not having the parenting they should hate having, not because parents, sometimes parents have no choice, they're not just to make a living, two parents have to work, and so on, or one parent. Uh, and because the, the media are selling them stuff. You know, the, the, what, what really bothers kids about a lot of the stuff on television, it's not the, you know, the, not the violence, and not the sex, and you know, that, certainly that's bad. You know what really makes kids trouble, that really bothers them, is they say, why am I seeing this? I shouldn't be seeing this. Why is somebody letting me see this stuff? I shouldn't be seeing this. This is frightening stuff. This is scary stuff. I shouldn't be seeing it. Why am I allowed to do that? You know, some of these should want to be watching over me. I think that's the scariest part, that there's no one out there looking out for them, making sure that they're not seeing this stuff that they themselves know is not very good for them. They may watch it, sir, they do it, but uh, at the same time, it's scary, and they know it's not. So I think we we really have to rethink uh, the way in which we see children and adolescents. And we can't go back. We can't, we can't turn the clock back. There are a lot of things we can't do. But there are some things we can do. And that's the sort of thing I want to talk about now. Um, and I'll just talk about some, a few, just a few things at, at the various age levels. Um, um, one of the fallouts of this kind of technique approach is to, is with little, you know, the, the idea that that there are things, you could, if you say the right things and you say it the right way, you can deal with all those kids' emotional problems. And so um, I was in a program with uh, one of the Gadot students, and uh, one of the parents asked, what about a two-year-old who's throwing a tantrum? And this uh, student of uh, Gadot said, well, you, you, know, you talk to the child and talk about my feelings and so on. I said, well, I'm not so sure that <laughs> it's going to work with a two-year-old. Uh, if you know child about well, two-year-olds are very sensory motor. I mean, they respond to sensory motor phenomena. So you, you stand up straight, you make a face, you raise your voice, and you get some reaction because kids are, you know. Uh, so it has to do with more than, than a, simply a technique. And we have to be aware of some of the kind of things that the children, way, way things children respond to. Um, one of the things I've been most concerned about most recently, because I'm a really early childhood person, is this uh, pressure to get uh, you know, uh, kids into first grade and all the, all the whole, we have a really a crisis in first grade in our country. Um, and it's because in some, I don't know how it is here, but in many states I visit, you know, some 10 to, in the community, some 10 to 20% of kids uh, are held back. and. You know, in kindergarten, uh, and they uh, have to repeat, or they put in transition classes, or something like that. Uh, because what happened was that in, in the past, up until mid-century, first grades had to be very flexible, because some, some kids have had some early childhood, some hadn't. And so, you know, I mean, only 40% of our, our schools had kindergarten, so it was not mandatory. So some kids have had some early childhood, some had First grades had to be very flexible, because kids were being all over the place. Now, 85% of children coming into first grade and the, uh, now have had some early childhood experience in one of the daycare centers, nursery schools, something or other. And so the administrators, in all their wisdom, have said, well, if you have had an early childhood experience, you should know your numbers and letters by the time you get into first grade. If you don't, you don't get in, you see. So we'll hold you back. We'll put you in the transition class and so on. Nonsense. Uh, first of all, uh, children grow at very different, it's a very, early childhood is a very period of very rapid intellectual growth, very much like early adolescence, which is a period of very rapid physical growth. Some children get the new mental abilities, which get called concrete operations, and enable young children to engage in formal learning. 
Some get them at four, some get them at five, some get them at six, some get them at seven. They all get them. They just get them at different ages. And to assume that everybody is at the same place because they're the same age is nonsense. And that's what, in fact, we're doing. Uh, and so, you know, and, and we, they will be, what, what harm does it do if you push them a little earlier? What harm does it do? It makes a lot of fun. Because, for example, to understand phonics, children have to understand, that they have to make that tremendous leap that Pierre talked about, is that they have to see that one and the same thing can be two things at once. And that's a huge leap. You know, fairy tales, you look at fairy tales, fairy tales are unique because they say there's always, the, the characters are always one dimensional. The fairy godmother, the wicked ogre, you know, they're all bad because their children can't have trouble understanding. And if you're an early childhood educator and you work with children, you suddenly see them in the supermarket, they don't recognize you because you can't be a person and a teacher at the same time. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we, and, and that's a human, and so to, if you, you know, phonics means that you have to see that one and the same letter can be sounded in two ways, exactly the same thing. Now children can leave hat, hat, cat, that sort of thing. But if you then say, show that child eight, the eyes cross, nine. But you know, young children believe that adults, up until they're six or seven, they get to operate, adults are all wise, all-knowing creatures. God, you know, wise beyond reason. So if this all-knowing, wise person says to you as a child, you should understand this, and the child says, I can't, I know hat, I know cat, I know set, but eight, I can't figure that out. That, you know, I don't know what that means. I mean, I, I, don't, that's, I don't know. I mean, and the child's just not there yet. But, but that all-knowing, know, all-wise person, this teacher's telling me I should know it. The other kids get it. I can't. I must be dumb. And ladies and gentlemen, we sent all too many children to school only to learn they're too dumb to be there having to do nothing to do with the child, having to do only with the fact that we're expecting them to, to do something that they're not able to do. And uh, that really is criminal, because these kids are going to go, I'm dumb, and, and you turn them off to learning, you turn them off to reading. You know, and the, the, the other thing that is so infuriating to me is that what children need to know to succeed in kindergarten and first grade has nothing to do with numbers and letters. It has nothing to do with them. Children need to know three things. If you can succeed in first grade, you have to have three things. You have to be able to follow instructions that the teacher gives you, or the mother, your parent gives you, or some adult gives you. You can follow instructions. Secondly, you have to be able to start a task and bring it to completion on your own. You have to you start a puzzle, you have to be able to finish it. Simple that, but you have to be able to start something and finish it. And thirdly, you have to be able to work cooperatively with other children. You have to stand in line, take turns. If you know those things, then the numbers and letters are easy. It's the social things which are the most difficult. And those, we sort of get it all turned around. So again, I, 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 and now I'm sort of getting into educational policy now. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so I, I think we have to recognize and get back to more flexible programming, uh, multi-age grouping. There are a lot of different ways we can do it, but we, we shouldn't be punishing children because they're developmentally at, grow at different rates. And we shouldn't be pushing kids and turning kids off to learning in that way. Anyway, um, if we go up to the school-age uh, kids, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, we used to talk about in school was the social adjustment. We used to talk about children being well-adjusted, you know, you're well-adjusted and you're maladjusted. We were concerned about children's ability to get along with other kids. You're socially adjusted, and that was a big thing, maladjusted, maladjusted. You know, you have to get along with other kids, and you didn't. You know, when kids went to a birthday party, Parents come back and say, were you, you know, were you good? But today, you see, we're no longer concerned with social adjustment. Today, we're concerned with self-esteem, how you feel about yourself. You do, not along whether you get along with other kids, but how, how you feel about it. You go to a party, parents can come home and say, did you win? You see, you are good. Uh, a whole different world. And, and as a consequence, I think we, we get this whole thing that children should never feel bad about themselves. They have to build up their self-esteem. Well, um, you know, sometimes children need to feel badly about themselves. We're human beings, we all make mistakes, we say the wrong thing, we do the wrong thing, we hurt other people. And it's important to, you know, to say we're sorry. 
Guilt is a healthy emotion. You know, it really is. Really, if you're Catholic, you know that. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, we shouldn't make children feel unhappy unnecessarily, but certainly if a child does something that makes another child feel like hurt somebody, it makes, you know, the, the child should learn about it. That, that's, uh, unfortunately, you know, when you touch a hot stove, you learn immediately because uh, there's immediate reaction. But in social life, unfortunately, there aren't immediate reactions. You can hurt somebody else and there's no immediate feedback to you that, that you did something wrong. So somebody has to do that and help children learn that, uh, you know, that, the thing, that their actions have consequences. So it's certainly we don't want to go out of our way to make children feel badly about themselves, but certainly it's important for children to learn that their actions do have consequences, and the things they do and say can be hurtful, and uh, that they should feel badly about that. That's a healthy thing. Uh, you know. um, another uh, thing that um, I think, you know, particularly parents today, because we're putting kids in so many programs and all these things, um, is that this notion we have about transfer of training, that somehow you know, there's a, this notion of transfer, if, if you, for example, if you, the child signs up for piano lessons and then doesn't follow through them, he is not making, he's not following through with his commitment and therefore he's never going to make a commitment and he's never going to follow through it in a whole life, you see. If you don't stay with this, you'll never do it, I'm never, you know. <laughs> there's no training, you know, there's very little transfer training. I mentioned Montessori. In Montessori schools, children learn to put everything away neatly at the end of the day. They learn that very well. But if you go visit them in their homes, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a very little transfer training. Uh, and I, I think we have to remember that. And, and children are young. They don't know exactly what they need to do or what they want to do. And so when I was reading that, um, uh, this uh, young woman uh, who is, uh, this, she has an operatic voice, uh, she's from Wales, and she's 15. And, so, um, and she tried out a lot of things. She tried the piano, she tried the, you know, the painting and singing. And her mother just let her try those things. And then she said, let me, I, I was nine, she was nine years old, let me take some singing lessons. Her mother was very open about letting her try different things. And kids uh, don't know what they can do well. And so they need it. Certainly they should give it a good try. Certainly they should stay with it for a few months and so on. But if a kid really doesn't like it and, and can't and to fight with them about it, it really doesn't make any sense. And this idea that somehow if you don't stay with it, you're never going to learn commitment doesn't make any sense either. It's really So children are young. They need to experiment. And, and the most important thing is always to leave doors open. Always to leave doors open for kids. Because uh, you know, sometimes we say, well, if you don't do this, you'll never, I'll never give you another lesson because you're not sticking with it and so on. And, and that's that sort of thing. Um, and so, again, it's very important to leave doors open. I just give you a personal example. Um, my uh, middle son uh, is mathematically gifted, and, and, uh, did, but he's also a middle son of rebellious and that kind of stuff, typical kid. Okay. And, uh, he would always get in trouble in school, not because he was doing anything bad, but because he always got to his answers a different way than the teacher did. You know, he's always found his own way. He got the right answer, but he came to it his own way. And he get in, and finally he decided in 11th grade that he was going to drop out of school. So I was not very happy about that. <laughs> and I started, you know, I'm going to disinherit you, you're going to let you howl, and all that stuff. And my wife, who's a better psychologist than I am, said, this is not about you. Because <laughs> I had all this worry, my friend, what my, I, my colleague's going to say, and my reputation, and so on. Uh, he said, he's a decent kid, he's a good kid, he's not done anything, he's not done anything bad, he's not a drug, I didn't say, you know, he's a decent kid. Um, and he's, you know, the school is just not dealing with, with him, you know, his abilities, and so, we said, okay, well, you know, maybe this is maybe you need to take some time off. If you go back to school, we'll support you, and you know, as your brothers will, and going to college and stuff. And so, uh, we did. Leave, and he sort of, and he knew that he had the support. He didn't kick him out or anything. And so he fooled around. He drove a cab. He, he plays the sax and played with the band and traveled around a little bit and uh, worked as, uh, in a uh, <coughs> restaurant. And then decided, well, maybe this wasn't it. So he got a job, a part-time job with a major biotech firm in Boston and began doing their computer stuff and found out that he was good at computers. And, um, and they kept telling him to work full-time, they would send him to school, and so he decided to do that and uh, started wearing a tie and got rid of the earrings and all that stuff. Uh, 
And you know, so he gra graduated with honors. <laughs> uh, and now is working for working on his uh, master's degree in uh, computer science and working for a major uh, computer firm. Um, the, the point is that um, you know, every kids are different. Everybody has their own trajectory. So I don't know there are kids went straight through. They're just the straight arrow. Thing. But he had to do it his way, and he had to do it part time. He had to work part time, and, and kids are different, and we have to acknowledge that and recognize that not all of them do the same thing. But we shouldn't shut doors on kids. We shouldn't say because you're not doing it the way I want you to do it, then you're never going to do it. We're not going to support. You know, I think we have to leave doors open and, and allow them to find their own way and, and support them in that because each kid is different, and, and each one is, needs to find it in their own way, and we need to sort of back off and recognize that it's not about us, as I, I discovered, that it's really about them. Um, another uh, thing that I sometimes uh, find, because we have less time today, we're so short, and we, we sort of interrogate kids. Where'd you go? Oh, what did you do? Nothing. You know, and so we, we're, we're the interrogators, because we don't have time, we want to know what you we want to find out what you're doing. And I think uh, being an interrogator sometimes turns kids off, and sometimes we have to share with children. And, and one of the things that I think is important to do is to, to not to share. And then one, for example, you might say, you know, I had a terrible day today, or I had a great day today. You know, I, the office is came in and really trying to sell me all this stuff. And we go through some of the things. And sometimes when we do that, when we talk about our own day and our own experience, kids are much more willing to share with them. Because we're, we're always sort of on one side, but sometimes the sharing is, is helpful. And uh, it even works sometimes with, um, not always, I don't promise this, but, but keeping rooms clean. <laughs> I discovered with my own kids that, that um, clean has many different definitions. <laughs> See, what I meant about clean, my son, when clean was, you pick up a couple of socks, you've cleaned your room, you see. And so we have to, and I, I, in fact, I must admit that I have a different definition of clean than my wife does, <laughs> but I don't want to go there. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> in any case, uh, sometimes one of the things, excuse me, one of the things you can say is, you know, look, I'll help you clean your room if you'll help me clean mine. In that way, sometimes you can spend some time talking, and kids are more willing, maybe more willing to help you do that than if uh, you sort of make it a, a unilateral kind of thing as a joint. So there, the sharing is a, is a very important kind of, of thing that uh, I think we should do. Um, just a couple of, of others. Um, one of the things that is very common in these days, both at home and in schools, is the use of timeouts. Because the kids are misbehaving, want to put them in timeout or hurt a timeout so they'll reflect on their bad behavior. <coughs> I don't think when children are in a timeout that they spend their time.